All right. My name is Burr Sutter. I'm coming to you live from Dev Nexus right now. So if you hear a bunch of noise in my background, that's because I've got a whole bunch of people here. here I turn the camera around where you guys can see it. Right? So you, right now we're actually in session at Dev Nexus, so there's not a lot of people running around the exhibit hall, but you can see it's a fairly big area. There's over 2,000 people here. I did the keynote this morning, and we had a lot of fun with that. But now we actually have a great topic for you guys today. We're going to be talking about Linux, going hardcore for Linux. I'm excited about it. We have our star here, Max, who's basically worked on our Linux advanced cheat sheet. I added that link to the chat already. Make sure you grab a copy of that. We're going to have more links in the chat to show up for you. Also, keep in mind, you can drop your questions in the chat, add them there, and we're going to try to queue up as many of them as possible, get to them as possible, as soon as possible at the end of the presentation. So Max is going to rattle off all kinds of awesome stuff for us right now. You ready to go, Max? Absolutely. Let's go. Fantastic. Okay. Let me share that screen. That works. There we go. So, uh, my name is Maxim Berghout. I work as a principal solutions architect in the Benelux region in the Netherlands, basically, that is. Um, I'm going to show you a lot of Linux related stuff today. Uh, pace is going to be high, so if one topic doesn't really interest you that much, please stay tuned for a couple of seconds because the next topic might be uh, very interesting to you indeed. Um, very briefly, me, um, I'm Jan Maxenbergaard. I do a lot of Twittering uh, on at Maxenbergaard at Twitter. I only also have a YouTube channel that I uh, use to uh, post stuff on Red Hat products as well, and a blog called 100 thingswithercom In all fairness, the blog has been updated fairly recently. The YouTube channel has not, but I'll try to work on that a little bit more. If you want to reach out to me based on any of the, uh, the topics I'm going to cover in the next 30 minutes or so, feel free to send me a message through Twitter or an email, um, but I do not have an SLA for replying. So I'll try, but it might take a little while, especially if it's a lot of traffic. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is I'm going to talk about elevated privileges. I'm going to talk about job control, history management, a little bit of Azure Linux, a little bit of ACLs. I'm going to show you what a here doc is. I'm going to look at networking, and we're going to look at um, management of services with System D. I'm going to try and mix some advanced topics and some some more entry-level topics together, so I hope I'll have something for everybody. Uh, so let me switch to my terminal real quick, and we'll dive right in. So here we have a pristine RHEL 8 machine. I'm going to pretend I'm a developer right now, and I'm going to pretend I'm a developer that wants to deploy a little PHP app on Apache here. Now, as you might know, you can install packages on RHEL with the yum commands. I'm going to go yum install HTTPD. Uh, PHP, PHP, the image library, and PHP, uh, I think Postgres is PGSQL. Uh, you don't have to use DNF, which use pack the new package manager on RHEL 8. You can just keep using yum. It will um, result in running the same binary. And if I hit this command, the, the, the observing user might already notice this is not going to fly because the yum command actually needs elevated privileges on Linux to install packages. Now, I could hit up at this point and hit left a million times all the way back to the beginning of the line. That is not really efficient. I could also hit up and then go control K back to the left, or control left arrow back to the beginning. That's not really efficient either. I could even do um, control A and go back to the beginning of the line and control E, go back to the front. But that, none of those options are as efficient as going just go sudo and then hit exclamation mark twice, which is going to execute the previous command, but then prepend it by sudo. Um, this, on its own, is not going to work either because you might have noticed I made uh, an intentional typo there. Uh, all because I wanted to show you a little nifty, nifty trick that you can do with uh, your history in, the, in Linux, which is by um, correcting your previous command. And I could go um, caret, which is the triangular character I'm typing there, and just go, I want to replace this by this. And if I hit enter again, this command line is actually going to work, and it's going to install Apache and PHP and some other stuff. As that is running, which is going to take about 20, 30 seconds or so, um, I want to just briefly mention that I'm doing stuff as sudo all the time. I'm not doing this as root, because I consider running as root all the time to be anti-cheat. This is actually making your life harder instead of easier, because running as root all the time is going to teach you nothing about the actual requirements your applications are going to have when you bring it in, into production. So do not do everything as root. Set yourself up for a sudo account and use that if you notice that your normal personal account does not have enough privileges. Now, as a little cheat again, to edit the sudoers file, um, I would suggest you use sudo vi sudo. Just don't go 
using Vim or Emacs or whatever it is on the plain sudo or his account, uh, on the plain sudo or his file, because that has no um, syntax checking in there. You, you can just edit the file, save it, you can lock yourself out of the root account that way, and that is very, very inconvenient, as you might, be, uh, as you might imagine. Um, if you use VI sudo, as I'm doing right now, you actually get syntax checking of your sudo as file for free. So I could take out my plot user line here, and I'm going to comment out that line, and I'm going to comment out this line, and I'm going to add a comma here. That comma has a syntax error. Now look what happens when I save this file. It's going to give me an error message. It's going to tell me, you got a syntax error at line 110, which is correct with the comma. Now, what do I do now? I can either edit this file again, save it without changes, or save it with the change I would just made, and that would basically lock me out my, uh, of my pseudo's permission. So that's not something I want to do. I want to edit this again, go back to line 110, I'm already there, take away that comma, save this file, and now it's actually edited in the correct way, and go pseudo-l, and that can see all the permissions I have. So don't you run your commands as root all the time. It's actually going to make your life harder. Now, um, you might be familiar with the fact that uh, Linux has um, a history command for various shells Linux is equip equipped with. I already showed you the, the correction of the, the previous command with a, with a caret uh, notation. You can also just take a look at your history by running history, and you will see that all of the commands I've just previously um, entered are listed there, and I can um, run one of the previous ones by going exclamation mark, and then 8, for example, will show, will execute the, the sudo-l command again. Now, if I just go ls, 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 ls in this empty directory and run history, it will see that the ls command is only added to the history file once. And that is because we have this environment variable called hist control that is set to ignore dups, ignore direct exact duplications of command. So it's going to only add, it, add the, the ls command to my sudo or to my history file just a single time. But you might notice that I have ls here in twice. And if I would go ls echo, what, whatever, echo, ls, echo, it's actually, ls is actually in there um, a bunch of times, which is not really that convenient because I want to use my history file to have a history of as many useful commands as I can have and not uh, re repetition of the commands I have, I have to basically give a thousand times a day. So in order to make my history ignore all of the um, all of the, the duplications I have in there over time, so not just direct duplications, but duplications over time, I can actually set the hist control command to erase dubs. If I do erase dubs, now check my history, there's a couple of uh, mentions of ls in there. If I go ls once more and run history, you will see that the previous ls instances are now gone. So you get more useful history and less clutter. Now, you all might have had that situation in which you have to enter a command that is kind of secret because it has your password with a password flag or something like that. And this is going to add, uh, this is going to end up in your history as well. So you, all, you all know this command, right? It's a secret command and it has a password flag and my secret password is in there. Now, if I execute this, it's going to end up in plain text in my history file. Um, that is probably something I do not want to have either. So if I take that his control command again and add colon, ignore space to this, you can actually execute that secret command pretty, uh, well, not completely safe. There are better ways to do this, but I just want to show you this. My secret password, like that, and you will now see it gives an error because the command doesn't exist, it doesn't really matter. If I run history here, you will see that the secret command does not end up in my history file because I've prevented it with a space, and I have ignore space set right over there. Now, if you want to have this history, this hist control um, environment variable, um, enabled all the time. Every time you log into your Linux machine, you just edit your bash RC file and you go to the bottom, yeah. add an export there, drop that little line, and you save it, you log back in, and it's enabled every single time. The bash RC is the configuration file for your shell. Now, there's one more thing that is interesting to tell you about history. If you hit Control R, you can actually search backwards in your history. So I would go uh, his control, and I could actually see. Um, if you hit control R again, and actually scroll through all of the occurrences of his control in my history. This is reverse search, as you might see here, reverse. And there's actually a forward search as well, which is mapped to control S instead of control R, R for reverse search, S for search. But S is also mapped to pause my shell. So if I control S here, I can type whatever I want. It's not going to end up in my shell until I hit control Q. So if you have a shell that seems unresponsive, Try and hit Control Q because that will unpause your shell and maybe you get your shell back. So just a little tip right there. 
Um, let's move over to something we call job control. So let's do a ping of www.redhead.com right there. Uh, ping on Linux is not going to end. So if I leave this running, it's going to just end run on um, basically until the end of time. And if you want to pause this, pause this command for whatever reason, I'm going to hit Control Z. You will see that it's now stopped, and uh, I got a job ID there. So this command is now stopped. I can hit jobs, get the same output as there. Job number one is stopped, and it's ping www.redhead.com. I can actually take this command back in the foreground by running FG, and my ping command will continue running. And we'll just keep, you know, basically continue where the previous um, iteration of this, uh, the previous run of this command uh, left off. I can control Z again, or Z. I'm not sure if you guys are American or um, English or maybe some other language. Z or Z. And I can hit BG for background. And now this command, the ping command, will continue running again, but I also get my shell back. Now, the output of the ping command is going to just drop through my shell right there because this is a demo. But you can get a bit of a, bit of a feeling of what, for what kind of use cases this could be, uh, this could be useful. Um, I can hit foreground again, take this back into the foreground, and hit control Z to put it uh, in pause mode or stop mode, suspend it. Um, I could, and I'm not going to do that right now, I could disown this by the disown command, and then I just can log out of this machine, and the ping command will keep on running in the background. I'm not going to do that right now. Or I could kill the job by just going percent one. I'm going to kill the job that is already uh, put it back in the foreground. Uh, and I already killed it. So, okay. Sorry, sorry about that little confusion there. But I, um, as you see, I can kill the job that is in the background by going percentage one. It's going to terminate the job in the background. So I don't need to look up the job ID or whatever, the, 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 the process ID or whatever. I can just kill it by giving it, uh, give, giving, pass and kill the job ID of the job. Now, as you might have noticed, I'm not doing kill dash nine. And I see a lot of people going kill dash nine everything. Kill dash nine is like shooting a cannon where you uh, would have sufficed with a pea shooter. Uh, kill dash nine basically tells your program to die instantly, which is fine for a ping. But if you're killing dash nine, a database, your database is going to die without writing to disk, which is probably not what you want. So try and send programs the kill signal first without dash nine. And if that doesn't work, you can always revert to adding the dash nine in the second. Piece. Don't just go killing dash nine everything. It's gonna end up, you're going to end up in a world of pain. So much for, uh, for job control today. Um, I also want to talk about SU Linux for a while. SU Linux is something that is extremely useful in terms of security. Uh, some people find it a little bit confusing, so I'm going to just show you a little bit about how SU Linux is not scary and how SU Linux can actually um, be manipulated fairly easily if you know what you're doing. So I just installed Apache, right? Now let's just, for sure, um, let's just make sure that Apache can actually be started. So I'm going to go systemctl start httpd. Systemctl, the command you start and stop um, demons with on rel. I'm going to start that. And I'm going to run the status command. And it will give me a lot of information about this process. It is actually running right now. Uh, it will not run by default because the vendor preset is disabled. So this program does not run by default. If I install Apache and reboot my machine, it will not start it by default. If I want to have it start by default, I need to do enable. HTTPD, so I do enable, I do status again, we'll see it's now enabled, where it was previously, previously disabled. Um, and it's listening on port 80 right now. And that's interesting because my application is weird and I really want to run it on port 8001. So let me stop this for a bit. Oh wait, no, let me do, um, show you one thing more. Um, if we want to check out what kind of SE Linux context my application, uh, my HTTP, my, my Apache process HTTPD is running at, I go PS dash EFZ, or Z, and I'm going to grab for Apache here, HTTPD, and it will show me that my Apache process is running with the HTTPD um, as a Linux context. This is important for later on. I'll show you um, what I'm going to do with that. Now, I'm going to stop Apache for a while because we're going to change the port, and we're going to edit the, SE, the, the Apache configuration file and make Apache run on port 8001. In order to know which file I need to edit, um, I can just run rpm-qc, pass it the name of the Apache RPM, and it will tell me what configuration file we're in there. And I can also do QD, by the way, just gives me all the documentation. But I need the configuration file, so I'm going to show you the configuration file and the configuration file. The main configuration file for Apache is this one. Um, I'm going to edit that with, with uh, sudo-e, because I don't want to go, um, you know, figuring out what my favorite editor for today is. I'm just going to choose my default. Um, sudo-e starts... A, 
my editor in root mode, so in my case it's BI, um, start that up, I'm going to find the listen directive, so the listen directive tells Apache what port to listen on. I'm going to change that from 80 to 8001, okay? I hope you guys are all still with me. I can't see you guys nodding or whether, whether or not you're looking um, interested or bored, but I'm going to assume this is, uh, this is interesting for everyone. I'm going to try and start Apache again, and you'll see this fail. I'm like, why is this failing? Why is this failing? I'm going to run status, and status tells me Apache could not bind to address 8001, and that is um, actually pretty understandable if you take into context that this system is actually running SE Linux. So SE status tells me that SE Linux is enabled at this moment, and we can actually take a look at what kind of ports SE Linux knows about, manage, um, list my ports. And every port in SE Linux has a label, and SE Linux basically tells um, the Linux kernel, which application can bind on which port. So basically, SE Linux knows these are list of Apache ports. I'm going to list all of the ports and then grab for 443. Um, this is a list of Apache ports right there. And the Apache process that runs with the HTTPD content, uh, HTTPD underscore T, um, SE Linux context, can bind to port 80, port 81, port 443, port 8008, port 8009. But as you can see, port 8001 is not in here. So we need to make Azure Linux aware of the fact that we want to have Epi, um, Apache run on port 8001. It's the only thing we need to do. And after that, everything's going to be fine. So we'll be able to retain the security that Azure Linux gives us um, and still run our application on port 8001. The way we make Azure Linux aware of the fact that we, will, we want to allow Azure Linux, uh, Apache to run on port 8001 is we're going to do Azure Manage. We're going to add a port. And we're going to add port to this type here, the Apache um, as your Linux port type. We only want to do this for the TCP because, you know, this is Apache. Apache runs on TCP connection. And we want to do that with port 8001. So run this. Takes about a second. And then we run that command again. We're going to check for 443. Um, and as you can see, 8001 is now in the list of ports that are labeled for Apache. The only thing you need to do, I'm going to just relabeled that port with HTTP port T, and now I can actually start Apache on that port. You know, system CTL, start, start Apache, and now it's running. And you will see it's now running on port 8001. Now, if this all was a little quick, the, la the slide at the end of the, the presentation today, I have a link to um, a whole lot of documentation around Azure Linux, and you can just read this back um, in your own time. Um, but I just wanted to show you, SE Linux is not scary. It is actually um, pretty useful. It's a very, very good security feature that is in RHEL. And um, it is not easy to manipulate, and manipulate again, if you know what you're doing. Um, one more thing I want to talk about SE Linux in, uh, in the context of Apache Linux. Um, as you might be aware, um, Apache and PHP often run applications that need to connect to a database, MySQL, Postgres, whatever. Um, those, those databases might run on the same machine or they might run on a different machine. Now, by default, SE Linux will disallow um, Apache to reach out to a database that is running on a different server. That is because of security. We don't want Apache to do stuff that we are not explicitly allowing it. And, um, this is something we need to explicitly allow Apache to do. Um, SE Linux knows the concept of a Boolean. So we basically list all of the Booleans that we have on this system. And basically, Booleans are toggleable pieces of SE Linux that um, allow applications to do a, th a certain thing. In this case, um, I'm just showing you the, all of the Booleans that are available for SE Linux and then grab for HTTP, which are the Booleans that have to do with Apache. And you will see that there is one right there that says HTTPD can network connect to a database. By default, this is off. So SE Linux prevents Apache applications running in the context of Apache to connect to databases that are on a different system. If I want to flip this to on, I'm just go, uh, that's Azure Linux Boolean, and I'm going to copy that real quick because it's long, and I'm going to flip it to on. That's it. My application will now be able to connect to database. There you go. There we are. It's now flipped to on. If we want to make this permanent over reboots, I'll just execute this again with the P flag for permanent, and I can reboot as many times as I want right now, but Apache will still be able to connect to databases that are on a different system. Now, we have Apache running on port 8001 on this system. 
2001. This, this is the output of the test page of Apache on a Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 machine. Let's go to the directory that we write our application files into for www.html. Um, I cannot, as cloud user, not write in here because this is directory is owned by root. So what we want to do is we want to set an ACL, an access control list on this directory. And what we do to make that happen is we're going to run that file ACL. I'm going to modify my one, modify an ACL for a group. The group is cloud user because that's my, I'm going to give myself read, write, and execute permission for this directory. And that's basically it. And because I want to be able to read and write new files that are written in this directory as well, I'm going to make the default ACL be the same. And now I actually am able to write into this directory. And as you can see, we have all of the files in the directory itself now have the plus um, sign appended to it in the output of ls. Again, there we go. It wasn't there before. It isn't there now. And that indicates there's an ACL in this directory. So go get file ACL on foo gives me that um, I actually have read and write permission on this file. So that's pretty useful because we want to write an index here. Now the index I'm going to do, I'm going to write that index, index.html, with a concept called a here doc. And here doc is a concept in Linux that is often used in scripting, and you've probably seen one before. They look like this. Basically, they start with um, the cat command, concatenate, and then they basically a random word, and EOF and the file is often used for this because it's not often used in um, everything that comes next. Um, and we're going to write all of this output to index.html. The moment I hit enter, everything I write from this point on will be written to index.html. This is a definition. Y, broadcast, Y, R, maxim. There we go. Um, this is very nice. Whatever. Then I write EOF in the file. This indication that I'm done writing, hit enter, and my shell will return. I will now have an index.html file here, and if I'll curl localhost on this part, localhost on port 8001, you will see the output of the index.html file I've just, just written. I hope that is useful. I use here docs all the time when I'm writing bash script. So if you guys write bash scripts a lot, and if you want that bash script, you at some point, write some data to a file. Here, docs are your friend. Um, so let's move on. Um, as you might remember, I want to talk about this a little bit too. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about systemd, uh, even though it is an awesome feature. Um, but you might remember the output of systemctl status httpd. That it shows you the memory usage by this process at this point in time. Now. Let's pretend I'm sharing this system with a ton of other applications, and I want to limit my Apache web server to, let's say, 256 megabytes of RAM. The way to do this is by going systemctl, edit, httpd. And this is going to give me an editor in which I can override certain aspects of what we call the unit file in, in systemd. Um, the unit file, basically, let me show you one here real quick, uh, looks like this. This is the Apache unit file. There's a lot of comments here at the top. Um, unit file describes um, the dependencies of the Apache service, uh, which services have to be started first, what, where the documentation is, uh, what kind of service this is, what the start command is, the reload command is, how do we kill it, does it have a private TMP directory, etc., etc. I don't want to override this whole file because when the Red Hat package maintainer for Apache changes something, um, I actually want to get that change. Maybe this is a very silly thing to do for exec reload, and we uh, might change it in the future in a future release of the Apache package. And if I just overwrite the whole file, um, then I don't get that change. So what I want to do is create what we call a drop-in. And a drop-in is basically a little file that overrides only parts of the unit file that system of, of the Apache unit file. Again, we do that by going sudo systemctl edit. Right over there. Edit httpd. It's giving me an empty editor. I can now add directives that override certain aspects of that unit file. In this case, I'm just going to add an S, uh, a line to the unit file. I'm not going to override anything. I'm going to add a memory limit, limit of 256 megabytes. There we go. I save it. Now, check what happens to my running Apache unit. It now has a memory limit of 256 megabytes. It didn't even restart because it started seven minutes ago. But um, through the drop-in, and the 
right there. That's my crop in over there. It's the file I just created. I doesn't, you don't have to remember where you need to create this. If you do to systemctl edit httpd, um, it will automatically create it in the right location. Um, through the contents of that little file over there, I now have created a memory limit for this service. And um, you can override various different aspects of your um, systemd ctl demons through this way as well. Now, um, final thing, because I think we're almost out of time. One more thing I want to show real quick. Um, we know that Apache is now running on port 8001, but if we want to know what other services are running on this system, we can use the netstat command. Um, you can also use the ss command, which is fairly newer and has a slightly um, odd name. So I'm going to use netstat. And now I'm going to teach you something. I'm from Holland, the Netherlands. And if you think Netherlands, you think about clogs and tulips, right? So um, I'm going to pass a couple of parameters to the netstat command. And they will form the Dutch word for tulips. So you will never forget the Dutch word for tulips ever again. We're gonna, I want information about any open TCP connections, UDP connections. I want to, I want to see listening sockets. I want to have information about the programs that are running, a little bit of extended information even. And I want to see numerical representations of host names and ports. I don't want to see domain name colon HTTP. I want to see IP address colon 80, right? That's what I want to see. So it's netstat dash tulpen. Tulpen is Dutch for tulips. Here we go. We're going to run this. It's going to give me a nice little list of all the processes that are running on this system, including HTTP here on port 8001, and some other, well, uh, SSHD is running on port 22, as expected. That's uh, the SSH port. I can also do it without sudo. You don't want to do this without, if you want to do this without sudo, that's fine as well. But you're going to miss out on the PID and program name information, which is very, very useful if you're doing a little bit of debugging. So there we go. That is what you do with um, with NetStat, figuring out what processes are running on your system. There's one. Okay, let's do one more. Um, well, you know, I showed you a little bit of SE Linux. SE Linux um, still maybe a little complex. I only was able to show you a tiny aspect of that. If you want to learn more about SE Linux, you can use the man command, right? You can just man SE Linux. And it will give you a manual page. This manual page, as you might see, is not really that long. It's only 69 lines long. You can see that here on the bottom of the screen. What if I want to know more about SE Linux? Where can I find more information on this running system about SE Linux? Well, there's this command called apropos, which is basically a search engine for your manual pages. I can run apropos SE Linux, and it will give me a ton. It gives us close to 80 manual pages and information sources about SE Linux. You can all read, and if you've read all this, you're about as much an SE Linux guru as you, as you can get. Um, so that's what the apropos command does. It works for a lot of things. It's not just commands on Linux, but also kernel constructs and other, and other various very, um, very complex aspects of the system. But if you want to know more about a topic, just don't go man vi. Try apropos. Try apropos. Apropos can give you a lot of more information than just a single man page. It just gives you all of the man page. Um, I think I'm almost out of time. I'm just going to flip back to uh, my presentation real quick. Uh, there we go. This one we have seen. Um, if you want to know a little bit more, Burr already mentioned the cheat sheet. Um, this is the one I wrote, the advanced Linux command. I hope you can see my arrow. You can, yeah, you can see my arrow. Uh, the advanced Linux commands cheat sheet over there. Um, this is one Burr wrote, uh, predates pre pre mine by uh, a couple of years, I think. Um, both of these two are really, really useful if you want to know a little bit more about Linux. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about SE Linux, this is the guide for RHEL 8 that teaches you basically everything you need to know to deploy an application with SE Linux enabled on a RHEL 8 machine. And please do not turn up SE Linux. SE Linux is awesome and it helps you remain secure. Um, if you're now saying, but I don't have a subscription to RHEL 8, yes, you do. You can just go to developers.refhat.com slash products slash RHEL slash download. You can log in there. You can download RHEL 8 for free. You might need to create an account, but that's about it. You get a free developer subscription for RHEL 8. Um, if you want to see more Definition Live Talks, you go to definition, uh, developers.redhat.com slash events. And finally, if you haven't registered for Summit yet, go to redhat.com slash en slash summit. Register with Developer 20 because um, Red Hat Summit is really the coolest event of the year. Um, I think I'm through. I'm not sure if I can pass control back to uh, the team. Well, we do have some questions for you. Cool. Uh, we do have some questions for you. One right out of the gate is, does this only work for Bash Shell, or can it work for other shells that might be part of the operating system? Yeah, so the, the, there are a couple of shells that are delivered with RHEL 8. Um, Bash is probably the most popular one because it's the default. We also uh, ship at least that shell or Z shell. I'm not sure how to pronounce it in this case. 
or um, probably corn shell still as well, K shell. Um, this will work on Bash, and most of it will work on Z shell as well. Um, history manipulation might be a little different on other shells than Bash, but all the other stuff will just work. Yep, yep, good point, and I think that's a very fair question. Uh, people like the cat EOS thing. I personally love that one as an example. Lots of comments on the different tips you showed. They were totally awesome. Uh, Tux Key actually was helping answer questions in the chat. Thank you so much for that, Tux Key. And he had another question about that the add-on you mentioned. Do you have any more resources on that one? Any more oh, uh, data, I, links? I can get you some links, but I don't have them at hand right now. But I will. Um, let me update this deck. And when we put the deck live somewhere, the slides to download, I will have an extra link in there with information about um, manipulation of System D unit file. Does that work? Okay. And it's on Twitter as well, and that's way. Oh yeah, absolutely. Find you can do it on way. Twitter. Yes, I will do it on Twitter. Good point. Okay. And unfortunately, we are out of time. So hopefully, you guys got some good tips and tricks for this session. I think it was totally fun. I picked up several things. And I'm not a day-to-day -day Linux admin. I'm more the programming person. But, Max, I love it. Thank you so much for doing this for us. We're going to have you on Welcome. again, You're on the show again, when we have some more cool content to talk about. The Linux topics are always super popular here. So thank you guys so much for your time today. Do check out our YouTube channel. Subscribe to that. Follow that. And you'll get the information as these things get published. So more things will be coming out. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to Max or myself on Twitter. And chase us down. You can always email me at burr at redhat.com as well. B-U-R-R at redhat.com. That'll find me. But thank you guys so much. Thank you. Back to Savannah now.